watching Over the Edge from Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. And we're back with Emily Lactawella. Now, Emily, we we have an exciting week because we're going to get the first images from Ultima Tulare, at least the first high resolution images. We've all seen the the image of the uh, the two touching objects, but we'll get much closer now. Now, your main interest is planetary geology, the geology of the solar system. What can we expect from this um, this outer solar system object? What what are the scientists talking about that we might find? Well, um, so this is a world that hasn't been uh, hasn't really experienced much of any geology for most of four and a half billion years. It formed as one of the many thousands of members of the Kuiper Belt. It kind of condensed from uh, little uh, balls of of ice and dust. And it formed, as many of these worlds did, as a binary system where there are two kind of similar mass objects mutually orbiting each other. And through processes that we don't completely understand, but it probably involves interactions with other things out there in space, the two components got closer and closer together and touched and eventually became what's known as a contact binary. But because there had been a lot of time before that happened, the two objects had kind of developed their own separate identities and didn't merge any further after they came into contact. So what you look at is this funky world that has two parts, one of them about two thirds the diameter of the other, that just meet in a very narrow neck. And I think that for geologists like me, the thing that we're going to be most interested in seeing is any geologic structures at that neck. What happened when those two worlds came into contact? Is there still evidence of what happened four billion years later? Um, do you see like mountain ridges that were built when they squished together or fractures or other kinds of signs of tectonic deformation? Do you see anything that uh, changed the shape of the surface when the direction of gravity changed after these two things came into contact? So it's, uh, it's going to be really interesting to study the structure of the whole world, but especially that neck region where the two of them connect. Yeah, we've never seen anything like that in the solar system before, have we? Well, we've never seen anything like it that's this pristine, that still um, looks probably pretty much like it did when those worlds first came into contact. But we've actually seen lots of contact binaries before because many comets have this shape. Halley's Comet has this shape. The comet that Rosetta visited called churyumov gerasimenka has a bilobed shape. So do Hartley II and... Um, Oh gosh, so Borelli, and even a couple of asteroids that we visited have this shape. Itokawa, which was visited by Hayabusa 2, it's actually a very common shape in the solar system. It's just that the comets that come closer to the sun have then been greatly modified by uh, you know the sun kind of heating them up and blowing off a bunch of their material. So this is kind of like a pre-comet. It's a baby comet. And we get to see when we uh, get the, the high-res pictures of 2014 MU69, what this thing, what comets look like before they come into the inner solar system. So if you look at, if you look at a comet that's altered, like um, Holly's Comet or something like that, there seems to be a lot more intermixing going on than what you have with this object, where this, this object is just, they're just touching and they've only been touching, you know, for billions of years, but they, that's all they've done. Whereas a comet's right. been melting and sublimating and, you know, every time, every time it gets close to the sun, so the geology would get mixed up between the two objects. Do you? It's not so much that the geology gets mixed up. It's that the, um, the former surfaces of the worlds have been eroded and eaten away. So you're looking at kind of a decaying remnant of one of these things, like a decomposing comet. So this one's fresh and, uh, and the comets are decomposing. <laughs> So this is a, a a comet that's still alive and not dead from passing near the sun. Either that or it's been in the freezer the whole time, I guess. Been in the freezer the, the whole most, time. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting because if you look at the junction between the two objects, there, it seems brighter. And I don't know how much image processing there was in that, but there seems to be some sort of brightness where they're touching. Any idea what that might be? Yeah, you're correct in noticing that. No, it's not an imaging artifact. There is a brighter region near the neck. And in general, in space exploration, you can... Um, it's very strongly correlated that a brighter region is a fresher region. And so what you're probably looking at is a place where um, there has been a little bit of geologic activity. We don't know if that's from the initial contact or if it's stuff that's happened more recently, but I've seen some images that show where the direction of gravity points on this world. And it's really not intuitive because of its funny shape. 
But the slopes of the neck are very steep. You're talking about slopes that are 20 or 30 degrees. And so probably what you're seeing there is places where uh, dusty material or other stuff on the surface just falls downhill. And so when you get dust falling downhill, you expose fresher material from underneath, material that hasn't been darkened by exposure to cosmic radiation. And so fresh places like also there's a couple of other bright spots, they may be impact craters uh, are generally brighter. So one other thing, one other possibility with this and that we see this with comets is the possibility of organics, organic chemicals present on on these kinds of objects that could you know lead to some sort of uh, understanding of the beginnings of life what do you expect there organics wise well there are uh, certainly organic materials on the surface of this comet it's it's part of basically every surface in the solar system receives them even mars gets them from space all the asteroids have organic materials and the comets certainly do and this is it's going to be no different its surface is red. That generally happens when you get carbon-rich material, um, like, say, methane or carbon monoxide. When solar radiation hits it, breaks them apart, and then they recombine to, to form larger carbon-containing molecules, and those are organic molecules. Sometimes you get really big molecules with lots and lots of carbon stuck to each other in a very disorganized way, with usually with oxygen and nitrogen and other stuff stuck in there, too. Those are called tholins. And they're a very red kind of sticky material. All of this stuff is organic. It's not alive, of course, but it's the the kinds of ingredients that you would uh, that kind of were necessary to bring carbon and other lighter elements to Earth in order for life to begin here. It's also the kind of stuff you find all over Titan. Um, it's generated in Titan's atmosphere. Titan's a great big moon of Saturn that has a methane-rich atmosphere, and, and this kind of gunk is raining down on its surface all the time. So it's a pretty common material. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what kinds of materials the spectrometers on New Horizons are going to be able to spot on its surface. Now, Ultima Thule is just one object of many in the outer solar system in the in the Kuiper Belt. How how much material is out there really like this? Is it is it a is it a diffuse area where you just have, you know, the occasional rock or is there a lot of material out there? So yes and yes. <laughs> to expand on that, you know um, how the asteroid belt has lots of asteroids, hundreds of thousands, but space is big and so they're separated very far away. The Kuiper belt has much more material than the asteroid belt does. Uh, in, in mass terms, there's much more stuff out there. There are many larger objects in the Kuiper belt than the asteroid belt has. The Kuiper belt has about 200 worlds in it that are big enough to be round like a ball. And um, the asteroid belt has only one, and that's Ceres. And so there's, there's tons of material in the Kuiper belt, but it's a really large region. And so stuff is even farther apart than it is in the asteroid belt. So it was actually very difficult to find a target that New Horizons could reach beyond Pluto. And 2014 MU69 was picked mostly because it was in the right place at the right time, not because it was distinctive. It's just one of, of hundreds of thousands of objects like it um, in the Kuiper Belt, and it was picked in part because it's so typical. So it's 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 a good sampling of what's out there. Correct. Now there there's the possibility for New Horizons of of finding, identifying, and going to yet another object. Do you think that that that's feasible. Do you think that they're going to find something that, that they can actually get to with the fuel that they have left with the uh, spacecraft? Well, the um, mission managers, the project scientists and mission managers say it's possible, and I have no reason not to believe them. So <laughs> I'll bet you I'll, I know that they're going to try. It gets harder and harder as you go farther from Earth. Um, these objects are so faint. So I understand that they're going to be searching with their own camera, with their LORI camera on the New Horizons spacecraft. The catch is that looking through Lori is kind of like looking through a drinking straw. And in order to be able to take, um, uh, in order to be able to discover something that's moving, you have to be able to detect it in the first place and then take more than one picture that shows it moving against background stars. So I'm sure it's a great technical challenge. It's going to be difficult to get all the data down to Earth that you need in order to find the object that's moving. I'm wondering if they're going to be trying some onboard processing to try to you know, select some images that contain unusual or apparently moving objects. That's just a hypothesis on my part, though. I don't know if they're actually doing that. But they say they can they can do it, so I believe them. Now, how big is Ultima Thule in comparison to something on Earth? Um, it's quite small. Um, it's about 35 kilometers across. That's about 20 miles. 
Um, so, you know, it's city sized, basically. It's, um, it's a lot larger than the comet that Rosetta visited, churyumov gerasimenka In fact, it's larger than that comet by about a factor of 10, and it's smaller than Pluto by about a factor of 10. So it's kind of an intermediate size uh, range. It's it's so small that it's very lumpy, obviously. It's not a round world. It's, it's two round-ish worlds stuck together. So it's a relatively small solar system world. It's still bigger than most of the stuff in the asteroid belt. Um, so, like I mentioned earlier, there's the stuff that's in the Kuiper belt is a lot bigger than the stuff in the asteroid belt. So do you, do you think there's enough mass there to, you know, at that juncture where the two objects are touching, do you think there's enough there to sort of alter rock and create some sort of metamorphic rock? Or would it just, is there just not enough gravity for that? Um, there's definitely not enough gravity for metamorphic rock. The thing is that you have to remember in the outer solar system, these things aren't made of rock, they're made of ices, mostly water ice, but also other icy material like methane and um, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen. Um, all of these things are solid at the temperatures at this distance in the solar system. Most of those things that I mentioned are actually still relatively soft at those temperatures, so they flow, which is why you can get nitrogen glaciers on Pluto. But water ice in the Kuiper Belt is just as hard out there as rock is on Earth. And so um, you likely do have deformation uh, where those two, two things come together, but it's probably what they call brittle deformation, where it's more to do with fracturing and, uh, you know, earthquaking kind of, you know, d that kind of deformation than it is melting and altering the kinds of crystals that you get. You have to bury things much deeper on Earth, even where the gravity is much higher to get a substantial metamorphism and changing the kinds of the crystals that you have there. Now, that contrasts somewhat to the meteorite evidence like the chondrites where and you see, you know, levels of of deformation, but you still have chondrules and things still there, but it's been altered somehow. What caused that? Well, I think that um, meteorites, a, a lot of the meteorites that we have came from the catastrophic breakup of much larger worlds. So for instance, if you consider an iron meteorite, one that's made mostly of nickel and iron, or even one that has a mixture of the metal with those uh, little tiny blebs of green mineral called olivine, those kinds of things, you can only get that concentration of metal in the inside of a biggish planetary object, like, say, a Vesta-sized world or maybe something slightly smaller. But it has to be big enough for its primordial heat to be able to actually melt its internal constituents. And, and a world has to be quite large for that to happen. And so um, the fact that we get these, these metal meteorites tells you that we've busted up a, a mini terrestrial planet and are receiving part of its core here on uh, the surface. And one of the future missions that I'm really excited about is one called Psyche, which is headed to an asteroid named Psyche that we believe is probably a metal asteroid. It's probably the, the core, the remnant of a much larger world that got broken apart um, early in the solar system's history. And that's going to be a kind of world that we've never visited before. It's going to be so exciting when it happens. That's interesting. I, I, I definitely agree there because we, you know, we have all these iron meteorites, you know, that land on Earth, but we've never actually seen a metallic asteroid, but they have to exist. So They do have to exist. And of course, they do exist. I mean, if you look inside uh, Vesta or Ceres, they're probably parts of those two worlds look like our metal meteorites do. It's just that those worlds are still mostly intact and we can still see... Um, uh, and we can't get to the metal cores. So all these metal asteroids and, and probably Psyche are, are different. They're the shattered remnants of originally much larger bodies. So another chapter from the solar system's history where things were colliding and still settling down, but not as primitive as things out in the Kuiper Belt, like Ultima Thule. Correct. That's right. That was a bit of material that went over the edge. A bonus clip from a full episode of Event Horizon. New episodes every Thursday, so do be sure to hit subscribe. The full episode should be on your screen right about now. <laughs> <laughs>